Hello, I am Matt Williamson at Williamson NFL. This is brought to you by Live Casino as always. Folks, football season is here and Live Casino is where FanDuel Sportsbook, America's number one sports betting app, comes to life. Step up and place your bets at our self-service kiosk or with a sportsbook representative. Then cheer on your team and catch every heart-pounding moment of action on our huge 40-foot video wall. Bet, watch, and win at Live Casino Pittsburgh, Route 30 at the Westmoreland Mall. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. And here's what we're doing today. We're doing a two-parter as usually as usual, but I'm going to talk offensive coordinator. Um, I'm on record as basically saying I would not have brought back Matt Canada. Uh, I think his play sequencing and passing game concepts are really poor. So it doesn't really matter if I want to bring him back or not. He's coming back, you know, and I will say that there is some value in stability, especially with a super young quarterback. Did Tomlin and Pickett have a conversation? Maybe. Who knows? And hey, you know, like anyone, Canada is allowed to get better. I mean, and he did get better, and the offense got better clearly in the second half of the season. And don't forget how young that offense is. I'm not making excuses for him or Tomlin or the organization. I don't think everything I just said there is pretty factual. But again, I would have let him go. However, I find some interesting trends around the league that might have been part of this decision too. And before we get to that, what I want to bring up though is I still think the Steelers should, and I don't know if they will or not, and if they don't, I'll be a little bit critical of them. They they need to make one more offensive coaching hire to me. And I'm not talking about getting a new running back coach, get a new tight end coach. I'm talking about a name a kind of like the Flores hire from a year ago and call them whatever you want. Special assistant, senior offensive coach, yada, 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 pay him good money. Somebody that's been around the block, that's called plays, that's designed an offense, but he wouldn't be called offensive coordinator because you have one of those. Um, So that guy to me is missing in the building right now. And there's value in a couple ways for that is – Canada falls on his face in week four, you have a guy to hand everything off to. Great. Or he helps Canada and Pickett get better. Everybody works, sings Kumbaya, and everybody's happy and working together. And you add another adult to the room that's been around the block. But where I'm going with this is, as we record this, it's I'm recording this Tuesday, and the Patriots just hired Bill O'Brien as their offensive coordinator. Great hiring. I mean, Bill O'Brien was made his bones on the offensive side of the ball with Brady and Belichick, goes to, to Penn State, takes over for Paterno in that awful mess that he took over, turned that program around, goes to Houston, wins games without any quarterbacks, and then the wheels fall off in Houston. He goes to Bama last year as offensive coordinator. We're not here to talk about Bill O'Brien in the Pats, but whatever. Great hire for the Pats. But where I'm going with this is before that hire, There were eight open offensive coordinator jobs. That's a quarter of the league. And I'm not even counting teams like Houston that don't have a head coach. So there's a ton of open offensive coordinator jobs right now. I think the number is 12 when you count teams don't have a head coach. You know, there's no incumbent offensive coordinators on these teams without head coaches that the ownership is saying, well, hey, whoever the head coach is, you have to keep this OC. It's not a Dick LeBeau situation. And there's also seven now, with O'Brien being hired in New England, open offensive coordinator jobs. So I wonder, I mean, that's an unbelievable amount as we, you know, go into championship weekend. I'm wondering, and and I, and I'll be honest, I hate talking about assistant coaches because, you don't know what they do, you know, and and I've been in buildings and I can tell you who the good coaches are, but if I wasn't in the building part of the team, I can't tell you if this guy's tight end coach is good or not, you know, I mean, because they're not, you don't know what they're asked to do. I can comment on coordinators once they get hired, but not, hey, you bump up a running back coach to coordinator. Is that a good move, Matt? I don't know. I, I mean, to be very honest, but what I'm going with here is, I wonder if the Steelers, Tomlin, et cetera, looked at this current market and thought, 
there's a bit of a there's more of a demand for offensive coordinators than there is supply because you can't tell me that those seven jobs as well as the, the head coaching jobs are just waiting for four teams to finish their season and they were going to hire coordinator after coordinator from Kansas City, Cincinnati, the Niners, and the Eagles. I mean, there'll be a couple, but there's not going to be a dozen that are new coordinators from those teams or new head coaches. So I wonder if the Steelers are looking at it like, well, we like the continuity. We like things got better. We don't want to rock the boat with Pickett. And right now, there's more demand than there is supply. So who are we going to get? You know. So I think that's something to monitor. It's easy to say he has to go. But then what's step two of that? Lastly, back to, you know, weighing the market or adding a senior assistant or passing game coordinator or whatever the heck you want to call the next dude. Um, I think the Steelers, that doesn't have to happen right away. Because if I'm Frank Reich, I'm taking head coaching gigs right now. Then I'm going to listen to offensive coordinator jobs or... The Steelers job. I mean, if I was Frank Reich and I don't get a head job, Steelers don't have a head job to give, one year with the Steelers with a questionable coordinator in a very stable role like Flores in a very stable organization with Mike Tomlin and the Roonies and those guys vouching for me after a year might be a really good career move, you know, or you inherit the offense and go from there and, you know, develop a young quarterback, add that to your resume. So, I think guys like that, maybe it's Leftwich, Reich, whoever, would consider that senior assistant position, if it's actually available, I'm kind of just spitballing here, that's what I would do, over a bad OC job, you know, in a terrible team where you're going to win two games. But I think the Steelers are probably looking at the market right now going, the league is telling us there is more demand than supply for offensive coordinators right now. And we're going to see how this thing all shapes up after head coaching hires, the Super Bowl ends. And if there's another guy out there on the offensive side of the ball that's been around the block, they should absolutely pounce on me. Will they or not? How do I know? But that's what I would be. That would be my approach to the offensive coaching situation. All right, we're going to be back here in a minute and we're going to talk corners. All right, part two of today's podcast. Pro Football Focus put out their unrestricted free agent every team must keep. You know, their own guy that's coming up that they must keep. And for the Steelers, they picked Cam Sutton, which is my top priority too. I mean, we if you, wrote, if you go read my defensive um, blueprint for the offseason that came out last Wednesday, be another article coming out this Wednesday, um, my first thing was get get Sutton locked up. He's the highest priority of, of all their free agents. And I agree with that. And apparently Pro Football Focus does as well. And here's their paragraphs defending their pick of Sutton. Pittsburgh traded for cornerbacks Akella Witherspoon and William Jackson III in recent years. And both players finished the 2022 season with grades in the 40s, which is really bad for Pro Football Focus. They've continued to throw darts at the position without much success, but it would be smart to bring back a known commodity in Sutton. Sutton earned a career-best 72.2 grade in 2022, allowing just 0.76 yards per coverage snap, which ranked 11th amongst all cornerbacks with 200 coverage snaps on the season. Really, really good numbers. Uh, the big With the big contracts, they already handed out to edge defender TJ Watt, Minka Fitzpatrick, and interior defender Cam Hayward. Pittsburgh likely isn't looking to splurge more in the secondary as they look for offensive improvement. Sutton won't break the bank yet, offers familiarity in Mike Tomlin's defense. I basically agree with all that. Um, I don't know if they throw darts at the position, but whatever. Um, I think Sutton's a keeper. He has publicly said he would love the return, but that's what all free agents should say. I don't know why he wouldn't. He's a homegrown guy. Um, and the versatility and the smarts and the football intelligence and leadership and all those things, I think, are going to be very worth 
what they would have to get him for. And I also think the Steelers could probably lock him up before free agency at a little bit better price, slight hometown discount, you know, that, but that if he were to hit the market and have people pounding down his door. But I just didn't know if you guys realized how good a season he had. You know, that 0.76 yards per coverage snap was 11th. You know, I mean, every snap he took in coverage, he only allowed, you know, three quarters of a yard of production to his opponent. But where I'm going to go with this next is in terms of the corner market. I was listening to Daniel Jeremiah's podcast this morning, and him and Bucky Brooks, they're both former NFL scouts, as I am. In fact, DJ, when I got fired with the Browns, DJ got hired that same day. So he came in right behind me with Phil Savage, maybe at my office. I don't know. But anyway, it was to do really good work. And I was listening to their podcast and I wrote down exactly what DJ said, who's more in tune with these draft guys than I am at this point. That's for sure. He said, and remember, remember the Steelers pick, you're going to see at least 10 corners go in the top 50 picks. You might even see 13 of them. That's a big number in the top 15 or the top 50 where the Steelers have three picks. I also think it's safe to say in this corner class that there is not a Sauce Gardner or a Jalen Ramsey or anything of that ilk that is going to be guaranteed a top five pick or so. I think they're going to start start going off the board 10, 12 in that neighborhood. And then you might get 10 to 13 of them between 10 and 50 overall. Again, the Steelers have three picks there. So again, I'm going to, my approach is going to change the more I learn and the more data I collect, the more I watch. But as we sit here in late January, it seems crazy for them not to be one of the teams with those three picks to grab one of these 10 to 13 quarterback or cornerbacks that are going to go in that neighborhood. So if you can run it back with Sutton, an early pick, and then the other dudes you have, I think you're sitting pretty, you know, really pretty. So I just want to, I'm not going to tell you much about these guys, but I want you to be familiar with the names. Uh, Dane Brugler, another uh, draft Nick that I really respect. He works for The Athletic. He put out his top 15 at every position. So this has nothing to do with what DJ and Bucky were talking about. But these are the names. And again, none of these guys are Sauce Gardner or going in the top five. But some will test off the charts and will change. And, you know, but these are the names to know. And again, it's a really deep tier, which I think really sets up well for the Steelers. And with or without Sutton, preferably with, for all the reasons mentioned, I want to see them grab, make one of these guys a Steeler in the top 50. So Christian Gonzalez from Oregon, he's 6'2", 200 pounds. And that's a trend too, because Sutton is not six foot with long arms, runs a 4-3. But there are a lot of big, long, outside corners with press man capabilities, which is exactly what I'm in the market for. Joey Porter Jr., I'm sure you've heard of him. Yeah, he's 6'2", 200 pounds. Devin Witherspoon, who DJ had as the first corner going off the, the board. He's from Illinois, had a tremendous year. He's also six foot, a little leaner at 183. Cam Smith from South Carolina is another six-footer, 181. Deontay Banks from Maryland is also a six-footer, 207. He's a little more rocked up. I think he's going to be a really good tester. Uh, Kaylee Ringo has been on the, you know, the national stage here for a long time at Georgia. There's a lot of inconsistencies with him, though, but he's 6'2", 210. Um, Emmanuel Forbes from Mississippi State. Five, or he's he's also a six footer at 180, and these aren't the official combine heights and weights, but you get the idea. Um, here's the first of the slot types, but he's also can play outside. Is Utah's Clark Phillips? He's only 5'10, but 185. Caillou Blue Kelly is 6'1, 190 from Stanford. Chariq Stevenson from Miami, the U, he's 6'1, 215. DJ had him going in the top. In the top frame, they had him going in the first round, and he's the 10th ranked corner on this list. So you're getting where I'm going here. There's going to be a lot of different views on these guys, but they're all top 50 type dudes. I'm going to sc scroll through 11 through 15 real quick, just so you're familiar with them. Michigan has a guy, also a six footer, 180 pounds, DJ Turner. Eli Ricks has been a guy that people have been familiar with for a long time. He's at Bama, 6'3, 
62190. Uh, Cameron Mitchell from Northwestern is 5'11, 202. Carrington Valentine from Kentucky, who's somebody I don't know much about, but will, 60195. And Syracuse has a really interesting dude, Garrett Williams, who's 5'11, 188. So I just listed you 15 draft prospects. 10 of which I think are certainly going to go in the top 50. Maybe all 15 of them do go in the top 50 or shortly after the top two rounds. None of them should be off the board super early. So I don't think you trade up for a corner, but you sit back and with one of those three early picks, you land one. Hopefully the couple with Sutton might really have something there, especially because the style of corners that are available. There's a lot of six-footers, which is great. So... Okay, just a quick off-season take there. I'll be back tomorrow, over and out.